everybody, I'm Marianne Mohanraj, and I'm here today for the Speculative Literature Foundation, and I'm interviewing Kay Tempest Bradford. Um, Tempest and I have known each other for a very long time at this point, um, starting, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, but um, our first professional engagement, I think, was when she wrote a story, Until Forgiveness Comes, which was published in the magazine I founded, Strange Horizons. Um, although I don't think I was still running it at the time. And it is a, a totally blew me away story um, written in the wake of the Twin Towers falling. And it's one that I teach fairly often. So I wanted to ask Tempest to cast her mind back to that story. <laughs> I know it's been reprinted since that in an anthology um, about the Towers Falling, and I'm sorry if you could remind me of the name. It was um, In the Shadow of the Towers. That's right, In the Shadow of the Towers. Um, and so we can find it there, you can find it at Strange Horizons. In the story, uh, you have people who have been through a disaster and who are um, involved in an act of remembrance, and, um, and it's using technology to create holographs. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, tell me if I'm describing it right or <laughs> wrong in any way. And it, as a result, it's tremendously vivid. And um, you go through some, you put us in that moment and then you ask some very hard questions about um, who has the right to be there, uh, what kinds of things we want to commemorate and how. Um, so maybe if you could just talk a little about what led you to write that story and what you were thinking about as you were putting it together. Sure. Um... So I wrote that story uh, because I was living in New York uh, during 9-11 and like a lot of other people, it took me a very long time to even like process that experience. And I was pretty far away from it because where I was living at the time was Inwood in New York and that's like at the very top of Manhattan. And um, my friends and I often joke that like any kind of disaster that happens, like the, the kaiju from um, oh, I can't remember what it is now, but, uh, oh, Cloverfield, the Cloverfield Kaiju. Like, the Cloverfield Kaiju would never even made it up, up to Inwood, and we would have plenty of time to, like, escape from all of that, <laughs> because, like, nothing ever comes. But, like, on that day, it felt a lot less like, oh, I could just escape, because I'm like, I don't know what's happening. Right. Um, so, an experience that a lot of New Yorkers had. Um, right. And after that, I, even though I was still living in New York, I did, I tried very hard not to pay attention to the commemorations around 9-11, you know, mm -hmm. like, cause it's all, like, it was all too much. I still hadn't like dealt with my own, you know, stuff around that. So I just didn't listen to it. But then I want to say maybe like five or six years after I was like, well, I think I'm pretty well processed now. So I can listen to, you know, NPR on the 9-11 memorial and it, and I was wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, as I was listening to, um, I think it was Margot Adler uh, talking about what they were doing at what was still a hole in the ground um, and how they would have people come up and they would have them read the names of their loved ones who died. And then there would be like a bell strike to indicate mm -hmm. like, this is when the first plane hit and this is when the second plane hit and when the first tower left, right? And so like they were essentially like recreating the day because like they started at whatever time in the morning everything kicked off and they had people reading the names and ringing the bells. And I was like, whoa, y'all are doing some like really heavy ritual magic here. Like, do you know right. what you are about? And and I was thinking about like, you know, how, how did we even get to this point where like, where like this ritual is being mm -hmm. played because like ritual, even though it is like a key part of human experience, it isn't always part of like sort of mainstream American experience, right? right. Like you don't get a lot of rituals going on, but like they, they legit made a ritual. So I started thinking about that and I started thinking about ways to sort of get into that, the thinking around like the rituals around death and how we deal with it, especially when it's a mass death event mm -hmm. and how that might play out if the culture was different, if it was a culture that was even less sort of like squeamish than uh, general American culture is about talking about death, mm -hmm. um, because we don't deal with it well, right? And we certainly don't deal with it well when it's like mass death. Um, but, you know, also thinking about the ways in which New York City has, you know, 
been the venue for so many moments like that, right? Like I went to NYU. One of our school buildings was the is on the location of where the Triangle Shirtwaist fire mm -hmm. happened, right? And there was like some uh, at the time. I think this happened maybe in the 20s or 30s, where there was like a major um, like disaster on the Staten Island Ferry where a bunch of people die, right? And so there's plaques commemorating that. And like you know, even though the Triangle Shirtwaist fire happened like early in the 1900s, mm -hmm. I want to say like when I was going to school in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was still a ceremony in front of that building every year on the anniversary. So yeah, I just you know wanted to sort of process my feelings around the, the way we ritualize mm -hmm. um, remembrance of especially mass death and how that can be like detrimental and comforting at the same time, but for different people mm -hmm. and you know how when we ritualize math death, mass death in that way, it also can continue to like make it so that nobody can move on from their feelings about that. And so you can you can't move on into any kind of process of dealing with, you know, the the issues that led to those people committing those crimes, um, as well as like not conflating the people who commit those crimes with like everyone from their culture and how that becomes harder and harder the more time we spend like wrapped up in in like the same, you know, rituals and, and reopening of wounds. So that's basically what, you know, I wanted to talk about around all that. And then because an NPR piece had inspired it, I wrote it like an NPR piece. Oh, that's really interesting. I, okay, I've got two questions, follow-up questions. Um, I want to talk about technology, and I also want to talk about, I think maybe I'll start with my second question, which is about sort of when it's valuable to ritualize something like this, and when it, and or even to, to just um, put so much effort into remembrance, and when it can lead to, I think you, you've already gestured to this, uh, it can lead to damage, it can lead to clinging so hard to the past that we um, reinscribe these wounds over and over and it gets in the way of healing. Do you, um, I don't know if you want to add something to that, I'm, I'm thinking about, well let me, let me put that in and I'll lead it to my, lead into my technology question too. So um, I, I found that, I, I think your use of holography here probably uh, really influenced a story of mine. I have a story uh, that she might fly that was published a few years ago, and in it, there's a father who's lost a daughter, and he had you know taken holographs of her while she was alive, mm -hmm. and he sets up he sets them up all over his house, and so as you walk from room to room, she's there and mm -hmm. she's laughing and she's at different ages. So like so, someone comes into the house and at first they think it's full of little girls, and then slowly she realizes what's actually going on. Um, and he has to be evacuated because there's a, a disaster coming and, and he can't bear to leave this, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think it, that was influenced by your story. Also, I think by, um, I went to, um, I'm gonna blank on the name, I had it a second ago, the prison uh, right outside, Alcatraz, Alcatraz. I went to Alcatraz and I didn't really expect very much from going there, mm -hmm. but they had set up audio recordings of, um, people who had been there and they, uh, and I actually don't know now whether it was the actual people, it was probably actors, um, but as you walked past the cells, you they kind of faded in and out so you could hear the people talking. Um, it was yeah. tremendously ghost-like. <laughs> it was very unnerving and at one point it made me want to cry because I was, there was one man who was talking about how, you know, many nights when you're in Alcatraz, the sound of people partying in the city across the water it would just carry over the water oh, no. and, <laughs> and so it was it was incredibly effective I thought it was a, a really and that was just audio recordings so um maybe if you could talk a little bit about sort of how you were imagining technology affecting this whole process mm -hmm. right um so technically it's it is a magical process but mm. I also wrote it in such a way that you could read it any mm. any way because um you know the whole point was 
what these people like felt that they were invoking. And so, you know, a lot of people are invoking their dead relative as a way to see them again, mm -hmm. even though their dead relative is not actually interacting with them. Right. Like the the thing that's left behind. And I, I based That's this, right, that's right. It's more ghost-like or yeah. magical, yeah. But the thing is like, so, um, in ancient Egypt, there's five parts to the soul. And mm -hmm. like the parts that most people know are the Ba and the Ka because they get written about the most. And the Ba is sort of like your personal soul that goes from person to person as you reincarnate. And the Ka is sort of the spark of life that everyone gets from the creator. And then um, I forget what some of the other ones are, but then there's the Sheut and that's the shadow. And so it is like, it's not really a person. It doesn't have like the consciousness of the person, whatever, it's just like, a, sh a shadow of what they were. And so I, um, in, in reading some of the various ancient Egyptian texts, I came up with, you know, the thinking that if you were going to invoke the shadow in the place where they died, it would be like those few moments before death, mm -hmm. but you couldn't like talk to them. You couldn't say, you know, anything. You couldn't say, I'm sorry, and have them mm -hmm. like react to you. And that's, and that's what I wanted for that. Like not even mm -hmm. ghosts that came back and like interacted with you, right. but ghosts that just like existed. And so, you know, I, I wrote various people dealing with those ghosts in right. different ways. Some of them were like, you know, I came and I said goodbye and that was it. And then eventually that shadow would disappear if nobody calls them up, you know, mm -hmm. if their family member is not there to call them up. Um, and it's like, you know, sort of a, uh, it's, it's about letting go, right? It's like mm -hmm. they're a, a metaphor for like how they've let go because they no longer are there to invoke this shadow, right? But then there are some people in the world who think that they're not just invoking the shadow, that they're like literally pulling these people from the afterlife for this ritual, which then puts them right back where they were when they died. And they're like, that's not good for them. They need to be doing, you know, they need to let these people go and such. Um, and yeah, that was another thing. Cause like, that's what I feel like a lot of this is, is like people like really holding on, you know, to, to their loved ones, which I 100% understand. There's um, another story I wrote it's called Alain Vital, mm -hmm. and it was recently pr reprinted in Black Sci-Fi Short Stories, and it was originally in Sybil's Garage. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's the one where I deal with my mother's death. Mm -hmm. um, and it's based on a dream that I had, um, that I continue to have a lot, where my mother died when I was 20 years old, and she died from cancer. And so oftentimes when I dream about her, in the dream, I'll say something like, oh, how much time do we have left? She's like, oh, I have about a week or, oh, it's just today or whatever. And what I finally started to realize after years and years of having this dream is like somehow in my my brain was, was saying that like, I brought your mother back, but I can only back her up from death mm -hmm. for a certain amount of time. And that's why you keep asking about the time because like there's a time limit for how long she can be with you because then she's going to die. Like she's always going to die. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, from that, I wrote this story about a woman who literally um, brings her mother back to life uh, through a technological process um, where she gives up some of her life force, life energy mm -hmm. to her mother in order for her mother to be able to come back to life. So she's like sort of kept in this, like this stasis in the moment before death. And then she's given a little bit more life to come back. And sometimes it's for a couple of hours, mm -hmm. sometimes it's as long as a day, but like, however long it is, it's taking that off of the person's life, right? So, um, and so in the story, you know, the, the mother and daughter finally have the conversation about like, how like letting go needs to happen because the daughter is doing it too much. Like she's giving up too much of her life force and taking years off of her life to spend more time with her mother who she loves and doesn't want to let go of. And the mother at first is like, I agreed to do this because I felt guilty for leaving you, but like you've been doing this too much and you're not having your own life. Um, and you and you have to make the decision to let me go. Uh, and so, yeah, like I, I feel like a, a lot of my early stories were about like those kinds of things, like mm -hmm. the ways that people want to like cling to right. the people that they lost, especially if they lost them in like a terrible way, a sudden way, you know, whatever it is. Um, and like how, like what they might do to bring them back. And I remember when that story got published on Escape Pod, that um, there were some people who were in the forums who were talking about it and they were like, I don't understand, <clears throat> excuse me. They were like, I don't understand why somebody would like go to all this trouble, blah, 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 for 
for that. And there were other people who were like, you have not lost a beloved loved one. You have never had like a real big loss, sudden loss in your life. Because if you did, you would understand. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that right there is like, that was the most sort of satisfying, you know, comment I could have is that other people who understood that grief, understood the story that I was trying to write. And if, if it didn't connect with the people who hadn't understood that grief, well, that's completely understandable because like they haven't had that kind of loss. Um, and of course, obviously I don't wish that kind of loss on everybody, right. but, but like that it's going to happen eventually. If you love somebody, right. you're going to lose them. And so, yeah, I think about that a lot just because mm -hmm. I had that huge loss, like right in the beginning of my adulthood mm -hmm. and it's pretty much affected everything I've done ever since. I think that's super interesting thematically. But I also think that, you know, to some extent you're using text, to some extent you're using magic um, as as these vehicles for making making these emotions manifest. And and now I kind of want to do a side-by-side -side reading of like Elan Vital and something like um, Nala Hopkins and her Ganger Ball Lightning or um, this uh, the story about the Sukayant. Um, I'm liking on the title, but from Skin Folk because I feel like she's working with similar themes and it would be interesting to see the similarities but also the differences in how you handle these issues. So, okay, I'm gonna transition now. So um, <clears throat> so you've published a whole bunch of short fiction. I, I think, um, am I right that you're working on a novel? Uh, so tell me if not. And yes. Then, yes, okay, good, okay, <laughs> okay, good. You're working on a novel because I, my recollection is I've read some of this and, uh, and it's, you were uh, traveling to Egypt and mm -hmm. doing research. And so maybe if you could talk a little bit, we have a, at the SLF, we have a travel grant um, that we encourage everyone to apply for. Um, it's free to apply, it's a thousand dollar grant if you get it. Um, but maybe if you could talk a little about, you know, how has your um, travel research gone? What led you to work perhaps in that area? Um, just, just sort of giving people a general sense of, um, yeah, what it's been like, what the process has been. Cool. Uh, yeah, so the this novel is a steampunk novel set in ancient Egypt. Um, I'm still writing it. I feel like I'll be writing it forever. <laughs> um, but it's it's actually, this is the novel that has been teaching me like a lot of things about my process. So I guess I can't be like too mad that I'm still working on it. Right. Um, but yes, I did feel like I needed to go to Egypt uh, in order to like do well by this novel and any like sub subsequent ones I work on in this uh, world. Because I also really like my world. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that because um, when I was in college, we went to England for like a three week uh, class. Um, and one of the things that we got to do was we got special access to Stonehenge. So we actually got to walk into Stonehenge and not just stand by the fence and like touch it. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. And I remember that moment of standing next to the stones and being like, I have seen pictures of Stonehenge all my life but I have never gotten the scope of just how giant these stones are. And this is why it's so impressive that, mm -hmm. you know, people, however long ago this was built, that people drag these stones from so far away and then put them together like this. Right. They're huge, right? And I was like, this is, this is awesome. Um, so yeah, I, even though like I've seen plenty of pictures of, things in Egypt, like during my research and, you know, I've seen layouts of temples and mm -hmm. writings on the wall and whatever, I knew that like, I really needed to go mm -hmm. <laughs> to Egypt. And so um, I went the first time in 2017 mm -hmm. um, and and it was a, an amazing trip. And yeah, it gave me exactly what I needed. It mm -hmm. gave me the real like scope of things and just like mm -hmm. standing next to a column that's three times bigger around than you are mm -hmm. and um and just how how much like the the iconography and stuff is is always just like right there for people to see like i've done I, i've had to suss out a lot of nonsense in some of the research that i've done uh because there's there's a lot of nonsense in egyptology there just is because of just like the the way that the discipline has you know evolved um, but like one of the things that always made me go like, I don't know if I trust that is they would say things like, well, you know, only 10% of the population population was literate. And I'm like, that that can't be true mm -hmm. because why is there all this writing on the wall? Like mm -hmm. they may not have been able to be as literate as a scribe, you know, right. and maybe they only knew how to read traditional hieroglyphs right. and not hieratic, um, which are, you know, mm -hmm. different enough that I could see it being, you know, difficult, but like, I don't believe 
that like people in ancient Egypt were just like staring at like the, the iconography and the hieroglyphs on the wall and just being like, well, I don't know what that means, but I guess we're supposed to go in here and do something. Like, you know, I've been to Egypt twice now and I can read some hieroglyphics, like not a whole lot, right. but like I, I have done enough looking at it and remembering sure. like when people said this means that and this means that, that I can read some more of the symbolism. And I'm like, there's no way that people who like literally lived here yeah. <laughs> don't understand that. And that was something that I could really only like wrap my mind around with seeing just like how much of it is everywhere and how much um, is like, you know, on the insides of the temples versus the outside of the temple, because like some parts of the temple weren't for everybody, right? And let me tell you, like, you can't, you can't get a scope of the pyramids without staying next to some freaking <laughs> pyramids. And that was kind of the best thing of all. I also like have a great appreciation for whoever built them because I walked all the way up into the middle of the pyramid and whoo, that was hard. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, like that's, that is why right. like, you know, travel grants and stuff like that are so important because yeah, like sometimes you really do need to be in a place in order to like just stand there and see like what does that look like in the distance you know mm -hmm. what does this look like when i'm standing right next to it in order to be able to convey that because the conveying of that can be so key like it's really key for my characters because they're interacting with all of these different places and so yeah like that i knew that i needed to do it and it was like even better than i imagined so i had a, a similar experience when i um i went to sri lanka to do some research and i had known I had, I had read history books. I'd known that Sri Lanka had been a, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society for 2,000 years, right? Um, but there's been so much recent conflict um, centered around some of these issues that it's, it's hard to feel the truth of that, right? It had been a, a pretty harmonious multi-ethnic society for a lot of that time. But when you walk into these giant Buddhist temples and they're beautiful, they're very peaceful, you have the often a, a white Buddha carving, um, it's all very spare and spartan, and then you walk into the same building, just over to the side a little bit, is the Hindu temple, and it is an explosion of color and gods and goddesses, right? <laughs> and you have to think, they must have gotten along pretty well if they would build, they would go to all this effort to build these two temples in the same building and people would be going to, you know, worshiping at whichever one they chose and then probably eating together afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it really brought home the reality to me in a way that I don't, I don't think I had gotten from the books beforehand. So, so I'm, I'm really looking forward. I, the early draft I think I read um, uh, from your novel, I was totally enraptured by these clockwork figures you were using and the way um, the spirits were moving through the book uh, was, I hope that's all there still. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's totally there. Because <laughs> okay. I, I love that, um, but that was all before you went to Egypt, so I'm, I'm sure it's even more fabulous now and it's just I will, I'm not going to tell you finish it because I'm also working on a novel and I know sometimes it takes a while, novels are hard to predict, but I'm, whenever, whenever it finishes, I look forward to reading it. So um, I want to talk about the book that you do have coming out. So you, you've done a lot of different kinds of writing. You've done um, short fiction, nonfiction, you've written for NPR, um, game writing, but you have a middle grade book coming out. So that is super exciting to me. Um, it is coming out in September 2022, and it's called Ruby Finley versus the Interstellar Invasion. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've read a few blurbs, but I haven't read the book. So why don't you just tell us about it? What do you want us to know? Um, so I, this book came out of nowhere for me. <laughs> I was not planning on writing a middle grade book. It just like stomped into my head and was like, write me, write me. <laughs> um, and so I finally listened. But um, basically it's about a little black girl and she's a genius. Uh, she's 11 and she wants to be an entomologist. Like she just loves bugs and mm -hmm. insects and all the creepy crawly things um and so one day she's in her front yard she sees the weirdest bug ever so of course she scoops it up puts it in a mason jar takes it inside as you do with mm -hmm. all the weird bugs that you find just take them inside and she's trying to figure out like what it is she's consulting all her books and and the internet and she can't find it and so she takes a picture of it she puts it on twitter um <laughs> and she, she's not supposed to have a twitter account no <laughs> uh, she puts it on twitter and she's like asking other people on bug twitter like have you ever seen something that looks like this and then as soon as she's done doing that she looks back at the mason jar and she's like where's the the bug it's not it's gone 
And then she's like, why is there a hole? And then she looks over at the window and she's like, there it is at the window. And it's burning through my window screen and escaping. And then she's like, what is happening? So she runs outside, but she can't find it. And so she's sitting there trying to figure out like how she's gonna explain the hole in the window screen. Um, five black cars roll up to her house and men in black suits uh, step out of them. And they're like, where's this thing that you put on Twitter? And she's like, I don't know, it escaped. And her grandmother's like, she's not supposed to be on Twitter. Where is this bug? Why is this bugging about my house? What is going on? And so, and so, yeah, it's like, it's, it begins the adventure of like, what, why it is that like the, these men in black suits came looking for this weird bug that Ruby can't identify. So that's what it's about. And she's going to save the day, I hope. She, oh, she will, she will totally save the day. Yes. Yay. <laughs> will be no saving the day without Ruby. Oh, that, that is really awesome. I am really looking forward to reading it. Um, and I, I think I, there's just been a terrific explosion of fabulous middle grade recently. And so I'm glad to see your book joining the mix, Ruby Finley versus the Interstellar Invasion, September 2022. Um, and so we're going to start wrapping up this, but uh, Tempest also teaches writing classes and has for quite a long time. Um, mm. So she teaches them in person, she teaches them online, she can be hired to teach writing classes. And so we were, some of her classes that are coming up are on our website, which is ktempestbradford.com. Uh, but I was going to, we were going to ask her if she could give us just a little taste of some something that you like to teach, something you like to talk about. So. Um, so as far as writing the other goes, I have, I have so many things that I, <laughs> that I love to talk about. I'm just like, read 100 books, do it. Um, <laughs> but there are like two aspects of uh, writing craft that um, lately I have begun to discover that not a lot of people are being like taught or exposed to, even though they're like not, not new ideas. Um, and, or maybe like they have like really bad sort of feelings about them. And one of them is writing exercises, which you say writing exercises and some people are like, I'm out, peace out, running for the hills, like I'm not doing this crap, right? And then, um, and, and the other thing is like structure, like taking a really hard look at structure because mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's like also depending on how you were taught, but like some writers are, I guess, sort of taught to mistrust structure because it takes the creativity out of things. Um, but well, I think I think people also like mis misunderstand a little bit like in in just from the MFA program point of view people talk a lot about things evolving organically mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it doesn't have to have a structure that works right exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly and yeah we we get a lot of students who like say like oh I hadn't thought about doing this kind of background work because I've been told that like everything should come out organically and I'm like it's still organic though because you still have to make it up mm -hmm. um so like one of the writing exercises that um, we give the students in our uh, Creating Diverse Characters class and some of our other classes. And also we ran a NaNoWriMo prep course uh, Ooh, last year nice. using uh, some of these exercises. And they're all about character background. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the first one is like you, um, the character relationship background one is you pick a relationship that's key to the character's life. That could be a really good friend a mentor, a family member, a found family member, you know, whatever it is. And then you, um, there's like different questions that you ask, like, what was the beginning of this relationship? Um, what is the first point of real risk in the relationship? Um, what is a day that like a character would describe as their best day ever with that person? Mm -hmm. And then what is the end of that relationship? Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that like, I got this, uh, I got this one from Stant Latore, mm -hmm. uh, who writes fabulous writing books um, that you should mm -hmm. definitely check out. Uh, so you take that and then you pick, you know, say one of those scenes and you write out the scene. And then after you've written out the scene, like from the perspective of like your character that you're focusing on, then write the scene from the other person's point of view, that same scene. Mm -hmm. And not only does this allow you to get into more of like the background of the character, what they're doing, but it allows you to like really make that relationship between that other person real mm -hmm. if it hasn't quite happened on the page yet. Like maybe that person is out of their life by the time like your work in progress starts or maybe um, like you don't know the beginning of the relationship, they're still in it, like they're still friends or they're still married or whatever it is. Um, but like in exploring like, what was that first meeting like? Mm -hmm. uh, you get to know a little bit more about them. 
the other background exercises we have students do is to um is to basically like answer the questions of like what is your character's greatest fear what is your character's greatest desire mm -hmm. and there's usually some event in their life that has engendered those things mm -hmm. right so writing about that event like what has made them have this great fear what has made them have this great desire sometimes they're the same event mm -hmm. you know very often they will be and so we will have the students like identify that like identify the greatest fear and the greatest desire and then write those scenes of like how those came about mm -hmm. and again this is something that maybe you will have thought about as a writer like that they have this desire or whatever but you haven't like deeply explored where it came from mm -hmm. and so actually sitting there and exploring where it came from um again helps you to get to know your character better sometimes you reveal things to yourself that you didn't know consciously and and it's still organic because like you are just making that up in the moment. Right. Um, but whatever it is that comes out of that is gonna help you understand that character better in the work in progress as you go forward. Because I, I'm very suspicious of the idea that like you have to get to know your character over the course of them going through their greatest change <laughs> or whatever, right? It's like, maybe know them a little bit before that right. so that, that you can really imbue them with like who they are, where they start, because that's hopefully going to be different depending on the type of story you're writing at the end of the thing. I, I love that. I think to go back to maybe the, the first thing you were talking about, it, it reminds me a little of how that kind of exercise can also be helpful when you have written sort of cardboard characters. Mm -hmm. So I, I had one story where I had a villain and he was just just a villain and, and he was not very interesting. He didn't make a lot of sense. And I ended up realizing that, thankfully, and going in and I wrote a scene from his point of view from earlier in his life and it just crystallized everything it, it you know I was like oh that's why he's acting the way he's acting and mm -hmm. it totally makes sense from his point of view and no wonder he's being such a jerk here um, <laughs> and then when I came back to the story it I was able to write him more coherently um, in a way that made more sense so yeah, yeah I think you know I, I feel like also writing exercises can be like sometimes when you're new to them, it can feel like there's a lot of weight, like, oh, this is gonna be a big thing. But I, I, I think of it like, sometimes like running scales on the piano before you start working on a piece, you know, it's five minutes, it's 10 minutes, it's a little like jump start to get the writing muscles going too. So exactly, don't be scared. People. Yeah, <laughs> and like literally every other artistic discipline has this, right? right? Like, yeah, when you are learning a, an instrument, you do a lot of playing scales and a lot of mm -hmm. playing really simple songs before you start with something complicated. You're doing a lot of practice when you're a dancer, you're doing a lot of sketching that no one's ever gonna see That's when right. you're uh, an artist. Like there's all these things, but like writing is the one where like practice of that kind is like very undervalued um, and sometimes devalued because they're like, no, you gotta work on that work in progress. But like no words are ever wasted. And that's the other thing that I hear from a lot of students that they fear that it's like, oh, I've, I've wrote all these words, but it's not like I can use them. It's like, well, but you, you are using them because right. you, in the act of writing, you have learned more about writing. So even though it's not going in your work in progress, it doesn't matter. It's all contributing to your skill set and the bettering of your skills. And I feel like that may be something where we fail students a little bit with the sort of science fiction fantasy workshop model, because that tends to be very story focused and very like getting to a completed story, getting it published. And one thing I do really appreciate about my very early writing classes in, in college and my MFA was I had teachers who talked about morning pages or who talked about just keeping the pen moving on the page and um, just built in all of these kinds of exercises. I really like Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones, yeah. uh, which is just full of pages of exercises like this. So. All right, well, I, I've kept you for more than half an hour <laughs> trying trying to not exhaust all my writers. And we're, Tempest and I are at ICFA. We are at the very tail end of a long conference. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> we're finishing it off. So we're, I think, going to go probably poolside and get a drink next. But I will leave you with the note that the classes that she teaches, um, the writing the other classes she teaches jointly with Nisi Shaw, who is also a fabulous writer, uh, Nisi Shaw's Everfair everybody should go read immediately if you Indeed. have not yet um it's incredible and so i'm not sure quite when this will air the the next class they have scheduled is for april 9th to 23 so this may not 
um, be airing before that um, dialogue, dialogue, dialect, and narrative voice, which I'm sure will be amazing. But there are more after that and more future. So again, website, ktempestbradford.com. Tempest, is there anything else you want to leave people with? Just write. Write. Write <laughs> exercises. Write. That's it. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. This Thank was great. Thank you for having me.